Welcome everyone, they call me IntroTechOut and I like making first person shooters and dreams. So far I've made 4 shooters. Arena of Shadow, which is an outdated showcase of my FPS template. Arena of Disco, which is an actual game. FPS Combat Arena, which is a showcase of advanced FPS mechanics I had been working on until that point. And Cold Conundrum, a festive themed game with a small story and even a bit of voice acting. With every one of these projects and those in between I learn a lot, and I like to pass some of that knowledge on. That's why I'm doing this new type of video, where I basically do a deep dive on games I've made to explain how I made them. It's almost like a developer's commentary. This might be a one-off thing, this might become a series, I do not know. This video I'll go into Cold Conundrum. This is by far the most popular thing I've made in Dreams. It's currently sitting at well over a thousand thumbs up, which kind of blows my mind since it wasn't featured or anything. Now if you haven't played it yet, I encourage you to do that before watching this video. It's a really short game, but there's a small surprise in there that I will certainly spoil this video. Yes, let's begin. But where? That's a question I always ask myself when I'm staring at a blank scene with no idea what to make. Luckily, there was plenty inspiration when I started Cold Conundrum because I knew I wanted to make a festive themed shooter where you shoot snowmen. Generally, I make my games in this order. First, I create a small proof of concept scene where I completely work out the gameplay, so the enemies and the player character will be pretty much final by the end of that phase. Then, I start building the levels themselves. And last, I do all the design stuff, so the spawning of enemies, triggering of invisible walls, voice acting, subtitles, etc. I did that for Arena of Disco, I did that for Cold Conundrum, and I'm now doing it for this small Doom project I'm working on. It's gonna be awesome. A uh, small plug, I do post updates on this game on Twitter and I stream development on Twitch sometimes. So feel free to follow me on those if you're interested. But let's begin with the gameplay, shall we? How did I create that shooter character and the snowman enemies in Cold Conundrum? Well, if you've been watching my channel for a while or have been following me in the Dreamiverse, you know that I like to make gameplay templates. I don't just make these so the community can use them, I also make them so I can use them. My templates allow me to piece together the gameplay of a game really quickly. In this case, I just used ITT's Advanced FPS template and ITT's Advanced Enemy template. For the player character, I just painted the gun, made the muzzle flash white and changed the shooting sound effect. I also made a new reload animation, because my FPS template doesn't have one, to make it as easy as possible to change the gun model. Reload animations work the exact way you would expect them to. At all points, there's an invisible magazine in the player's left hand. When triggering the reload animation, I make the hand with the gun rotate quickly to its side as if to throw out the magazine. Then I make the magazine and the gun invisible while emitting an empty magazine. Before making the new magazine in the player's left hand visible and moving it towards the gun. Then I simultaneously make the magazine in the hand invisible again and the magazine in the gun visible again. Here's what I learned from doing these kinds of animations. First of all, every visible body part needs to move every keyframe if you want the animation to look natural. So even if at one point in the animation the focus is on the left hand with the new magazine, you still need to move or rotate the right hand a bit every keyframe. The reason is that humans just can't keep their hands completely still, and when that does happen during an animation, it tends to look really unnatural. Second thing I learned is that there's an exception to that rule, and that is when you want to emphasize the peaks in your animation. These are usually points of contact. You can do this by duplicating a keyframe and placing it next to the original one. A really good example is FPS Combat Arena. For the sniper reload animation, I duplicated the keyframe where the hand is about to pull out the magazine, so the whole animation pauses for a couple frames. This makes animations a lot more snappy and satisfying. If you notice, I didn't do this for the assault rifle on FPS Combat Arena, resulting in an animation that feels a lot more floaty. Things that also help with making animations feel better is controller rumble, camera shake and maybe even a short FOV change. Of course you also shouldn't forget sound design. Back to Cold Conundrum. Because I'm using my awesome FPS template that you should totally check out, I was also able to enable and disable certain mechanics. For this dream I chose to disable the flashlight and single shot slash full auto toggle. If you want to know how you can use the template yourself, I made a video on it a short while back. The version shown in that video is a bit older, but everything I mentioned in there still counts. Last thing I also did for the player character is that I made a new melee animation. You might have noticed if you've played the game, but it just doesn't work sometimes. I made a beautiful animation, but Dream just keeps rotating the hand to a weird position for no particular reason. Every time I change the animation it works for a while, but then suddenly it breaks and never works again. I assume this is just a glitch in Dreams, but I've no idea honestly. Let's move on to enemies now. 
For the snowman I used my shooting enemy template, but I made the puppets invisible before scoping a snowman model into them. This makes for this hilarious walking animation where the snowman looks like it's hopping up and down. Of course I didn't want crazy skilled hitscan snowmen, so I made them emit the projectiles included with the templates and made them look like snowballs. The projectiles are kind of funny. I made a whole video about my AI a few weeks back and I mentioned how impossible it was to make the enemies aim up and down when using projectiles. Then I proved myself wrong a week later by making the snowball throwing snowman in Cold Conundrum. It did take me a while before I found a solution, but the solution itself is quite simple. I basically put a follower on the projectile that is active for the first 0.5 seconds after emission. This makes the projectile course correct to the current position of the player during that short period. Because of these followers, the projectiles are also much harder to dodge, which is beneficial. I've since updated my enemy template, so you'll now be able to use this functionality as well. Something else I did with the snowman is to give the player some hit feedback. This is really easy. I just created a keyframe where I made the snowman emit light and connected it to the currently losing health output of its health manager. Now every time the snowman gets hit, he lights up a little, indicating that you've hit him. But even though this works, I'm currently still in the process of figuring out the best approach for hit indicators. Now usually you don't think about this, but when playing actual shooters, whether it be first person, third person or top down ones, you always know when you've hit and when you've missed a shot. There are a lot of different methods for making hits clear to the player. You can use hit markers, a special stagger animation, blood splatter, a special hit sound, you can make the enemies grunt or scream, or of course any combination of those. The reason why I'm a bit hesitant to adding hit markers is because the hit registration is still inconsistent. This is one of my biggest gripes with Dreams at the moment. The game really needs a hit scan option for health modifiers in my opinion. I'm still using the downright ghetto setup of emitting area of effect type health modifiers at the location the player is looking at. It works, yes, but only 70% of the time. The moment an enemy moves too fast, you can basically give up on hitting them. I am aware of other shooting solutions, but they aren't scalable, meaning that you have to rework the mechanics every time you add a new gun type or want to change the properties of the current one. All I really want is to be able to select a laser scope option in addition to the options we already have in the health modifiers, so I'm able to decrease the health of whatever I'm looking at. This is not just handy for FPS games, but for third person shooters, top down shooters, side scrollers and even puzzle games. Small rant aside, I did want to give the snowman voices at first, but in the end I didn't do that because I ran out of time. I'd advise experimenting with that though, it can make the AI seem much smarter than it is and it adds another layer to the game. I honestly don't think I have much more interesting to say about the players or enemies though, so let's talk assets and level design. In the first level you spawn in a hot air balloon that is about to land. Nothing special going on here except that I had to activate the invisible wall above the level after the player had passed through it. The invisible walls, by the way, are just that. Invisible walls. I cloned them all over the place to prevent the player from climbing out of the level. This is probably the right moment to explain my approach to glitches and exploits in Dreams. Here's what I do. Every time I find a glitch, bug or exploit, I ask myself, could a player do this accidentally? If they can, I try to fix it, but I also have a mentality of, if someone really wants to break my game, I allow them to. So the invisible walls are not even so much there to prevent cheeky players from breaking the game, I know they will regardless of how many walls I put in their path, they are more there to prevent innocent players from accidentally breaking the game by scaling a wall they weren't supposed to climb. But about the starting area, there are a couple things I want to talk about here. First of all, the house. The house, like 99% of the things in Cold Conundrum, is a community asset. I'm not really a modeler myself, so I tend to take stuff from the Dreamiverse instead of making my own sculpts. A problem with this is that your game can become a lot less identifiable if you only use public elements. Imagine if real AAA games all shared assets and music. It would be really immersion breaking to see one of the most important relics in Uncharted 2 be used as a prop in God of War for example. That's why I always try to remix everything I use. Now obviously I don't remix everything, but I remix enough that my games have some unique looking objects and hopefully feel less cobbled together as a result. Sometimes it's a matter of repainting or changing the tint, but sometimes I collage different bits and pieces into something new. In the case of the house, it was richly detailed. Too richly detailed for the thermo effect, so I deleted a lot of stuff. The house still looks really similar to the original model, but I of course also made an interior which wasn't present in the original model. Something I hadn't done until this point was contextual actions. I learned how to do that from the door included with the house. It's really easy, you just place a trigger zone and controller sensor in a microchip. You set the controller sensor to remote controllable, meaning that you don't have to possess it to control it, and connect the trigger zone to the power button of the sensor. Now if you're in the area of the trigger zone, you can control the controller sensor, meaning that you can assign an action to any particular button. 
It's of course also handy to display the button in question on the screen via a text displayer. I ended up using a lot of contextual actions in Cold Conundrum, like the picking up of the phone and the gun, traveling to the palace and drinking the hot chocolate. Moving on from the house now, I made the surrounding ground all the way to the lake from one sculpt. I started with a flat rectangle and added hills with soft blend. Then I made it white, added a bit of impasto and gave it a round flag type so it looked like snow. All the grass was just painted with surface snap on, after which I used impasto to make the grass stand up. The trees are once again community assets, but something you might not know is that paint doesn't cast shadows in dreams. So while a tree might be filled with leaves, the shadow on the ground just shows the trunk. The fix was, well, really easy. I just sculpted a cone, took some chunks out of it, made it invisible and impossible to collide with and set cast shadows to always. I placed this behind every tree. This means all the tree shadows are completely fake. Barely anyone will notice though, because no one expects something like that to be fakes unless they've run into the same problem. Now I'm talking about shadows, what about the lighting? You know by now that I like good lighting, and this time was no different. The things I did to improve the lighting in this scene should sound familiar by now. The sunlight was made white, I cannot emphasize enough how important that is, the sun brightness to 100%, the sky flex type to 4, etc. One thing I didn't do is push the fog range all the way back. Usually I do that, but in this case I found the scene to be a lot less atmospheric feeling with max fog range. The shorter fog range makes the scene feel a bit hazier, like it's a cold winter day. Of course I couldn't escape that the scene looked slightly transparent at times, but in this case it was a calculated decision. And that's what my goal is really, when I drone on about lighting. It's not so much that I need everyone to have AAA quality lighting, because honestly my lighting is also not really that special, it's more that I want players to consider lighting when making scenes, instead of just leaving everything default. So I have no problem with people choosing a dark sky, as long as they considered a light one. I have no problem with people choosing a short fog range as long as they have tested a longer one. It's all about intent as far as I'm concerned. Before moving on to the second level, I want to briefly talk about the general layout and level design. It sucks. <laughs> if you didn't know, I made most of this game in two days, so I didn't think ahead at all during development. I just made my little forest area and made my little lake area and moved on. There are three main things you should learn from my mistakes. One. Don't place too many environmental obstacles in your combat arenas. In the original released version of Cold Conundrum, there were just too many trees, and players got stuck on them, the enemies got stuck on them, and it just turned into a jank fest. 2. Don't place too few environmental obstacles either. In the lake part of the first level, there's just nothing to take cover behind, which is obviously something you shouldn't do. 3. Make the design of your game clear with the level design. Here's what happened. I got a lot of feedback from players, and I saw this in live streams as well, is that they thought the game would just be an infinite fight until you die shooter. The reason is because I throw the player into this arena, I spawn enemies out of thin air, and I don't put a counter or anything on screen to indicate the amount of enemies is finite. There's also an invisible wall that disappears when the enemies have been defeated, which is of course a really lazy way to design levels. But the funny thing is, while we can all laugh at my rushed levels, Doom 2016, the actual game, did more or less the exact same thing with enemies. You enter a room, enemies spawn out of thin air, the room is closed and there's nothing on screen to indicate the amount of enemies is finite. The difference is, Doom 2016 did one simple thing that makes it 100 times better. Every time you enter one of these large rooms where enemies spawn, a pre-recorded message will blast through the speakers saying, demonic presence at unsafe levels, lockdown in effect. This indicates to the player that once they defeat the enemies, the room will no longer be on lockdown. I could have honestly done a similar thing in Cold Conundrum, but I unfortunately didn't even realize this would be a problem in the first place. People who play Dreams simply don't expect people to make games with a beginning, middle and end. It's good to keep that in mind when making your own games. Now we get to the second level, the palace. A lot of mistakes were made in this one as well, but one thing I hopefully did get right is the surprise. See, I like surprising people. In Cold Conundrum, I wanted the player to think the game would end after the boss fight. But no, after drinking some suspicious hot chocolate, I transferred the player to this psychedelic Christmas world where you have to platform your way to the end. About the boss fight itself, here's how I made the boss. I took a regular snowman and made him bigger. I took a regular snowball projectile and made it do more damage. Last, to really make the fight more engaging, memorable, emotional, dare I say epic. I increased the health of the snowman to a really high amount. Okay, this boss is as lazy as they come, and I don't recommend doing the same thing if your game really ends after beating him, just saying. 
And while I think the idea of the psychedelic Christmas world was great, the execution could have been much better. The main problem is that this section was just way too hard. I had this bit with rotating platforms you get pushed off of, and people got destroyed at that section. Now, I did put a difficulty setting in the game, and if you choose easy, the platforms will not rotate, but all the players who played this game on normal encountered a pretty severe difficulty spike here. Just ask Little Big Animation or Ugly Sofa Gaming. Did I anticipate this? Not at all. I could easily do this whole section without dying, and I did it over and over again while testing logic. Matter of fact, there weren't even checkpoints in between the rotating platforms in the original version of Cold Conundrum, because I was so sure people would find it way too easy otherwise. Yeah, that was not the case at all. But that's about it for part 1 of my Cold Conundrum deep dive. In the next part we will discuss the spawning of enemies, voice acting, difficulty settings and more. I got part 2 in the works already, so it shouldn't be too long until I upload that one as well. For now though, I thank you very much for watching and I'll see you around.